Unit 2, Topic A, Lesson 9, Why Do We Use the Number 360? That's the name of the lesson, altered just a little bit. We're going to review something so that we can translate it into what we're doing currently. Stretching and compressing of graphs. And we're going to look at quadratic equation examples and take note of those and then transfer that review over to trigonometric functions to see how they are stretched and compressed. Okay, so look at these series of graphs that are quadratic that I'm going to put on the screen and see if you can tell what is happening to them. Here is y equals x squared. So just look at that, try to take a photographic, a mental photographic picture of that. Now look at the next one y equals 2x squared. What has happened from the first one to the second one? Got more narrow. What about y equals 3x squared? Still going to get narrow. And 4x squared, it's still going inward. So look at all those graphs together. We started with the black one, and on the black one here, that was x squared. The red one was 2x squared, the blue one 3x squared, and the green one 4x squared. So when you add a constant value up against that x squared and increase that value, even though the value increases, the graph is going to shrink in this way. So it started out like this, but now it ends up eventually like that the higher up the constant goes. So apply that information to trigonometric functions. Here is sine theta, which we've already graphed before. We've done sine theta. We plotted that yesterday all the way through. Your first maximum occurs at 90 degrees, and then it comes back down, and the first minimum occurs at 270 degrees. Keep that in mind and look at the next graph. Sine of 2 theta. The first maximum now occurs at 45 degrees and the first minimum at 135 degrees. What has happened to that 90 that was up here and the 270 that was down here? To go from 90 to 45, what can you do? Divide by 2. So our constant was 2, but you've divided by 2 to get these new maximums and minimums, as well as the x-intercepts. Here is sine of 3 theta. Remember, sine theta had the first maximum at 90 degrees. Sine 3 theta has its first maximum at 30 degrees. So you have divided by 3. Divide 90 by 3 to get 30. And 270 divided by 3 is 90. So, and it's compressing the graph together. The waves are getting compressed. So sine theta, sine 2 theta, and sine 3 theta all on one graph. That really looks like a mess. But if you notice, this is where we started. I've labeled the points of sine theta to show where the original one is at. And then when we went to 2 theta, went to here, 3 theta, here. I've put the, I've zoomed in on that area to show you this. So there was sine theta, this was sine theta, but when we went to sine 2 theta, we've cut that in half. When we went to sine 3 theta, we've cut that into a third. So it compresses it together. Fractional constants on trigonometric functions. If a constant that's an integer makes it compress together, what would a fractional constant do? Stretch it out. Alright, so here's sine of a half theta. And notice that, remember that sine theta had its first maximum at 90. So for a half, we've doubled it. 
I know it seems contradictory in nature to think that you're doubling something just because you see a half, but that's the way it works. So the first maximum is now at 180, crosses at 360, and then your first minimum is at 540. Remember the first minimum was at 270 for sine theta, so you've doubled that as well. And sine of one-third theta, for sine theta the first maximum was at 90, you multiply that by 3 now and it's at 270. The x-intercept was at 180 for the original graph, now it's at 540. And the first uh, minimum was at 270 for the original graph, now it's at 810 because 270 times 3 is 810. So I put both of those on one graph. If I did one half, this is what it looked like here. And if I did one third, it stretched it out even further. The bulk of the lesson today is about radians and the circle. Uh, so we're going to convert from degrees to radians and radians to degrees. But none of that's going to make any sense if you don't know what a radian actually is. So that's what we're going to look at. Now you don't have to write all this down, but I'll even draw a diagram to explain it. In fact, I already have some on the next slide. But a circle is defined by a point and a radius. That's, get, that's common sense. If you have a center and a, and a radius and a point out there, you can make a circle. If we start with a circle of any radius and look at a sector of that circle with an arc length equal to the length of the radius, then the central angle of that sector is always the same size. We define a radian to be the measure of that central angle and denote it by one rad, which is one radian. Here's what I just said. Here's a circle with a center, and there's a point out there. You have a radius of any size, so I'm just going to call this radius six feet. I will now create another radius such that the arc that is generated will be the same length as the radius. So we'll make this six feet, meaning that this arc here has a measurement of six feet. And I've done that on purpose. It doesn't occur always. You, you can realize that if I had an, an arc that was created by doing this and then going out here, for six feet that this would not be six feet. I've created this such that the radius here, the radius here, and the length of that arc is six feet. When you do that, you have created one radian. And there's only a certain number of radians that you can fit into one circle. And I'm going to let you take a guess at that once we look at the next screen. So here's another example of what I've just drawn. This one has one centimeter for the radius, and they've opened them up enough to have a one centimeter length for that arc. That's one radian. This one has two centimeters for a radius and a two centimeter arc. Regardless, it still creates just one radian. And for any circle of radius r and another radius r, and an arc length created by that that is still r, you're still just going to have one radian. This drawing is perfectly to scale. So I want you to take a guess at how many radians that you can get out of one circle. And Davis says six. Anybody else want to take a guess? Yeah. She says eight. And it, we'll take another guess. We'll have three. Anybody go for seven? I'll go for Okay, Lewis is going to go for seven. All right. Here we go. We're going to figure out which one was the closest coming up. One radian measures how far one radius will wrap around the circle. That only makes sense because if you have a circle and a radius and a radius and they're spread apart such that the arc length is the same measurement, that's one radian is how far the radius of that circle will wrap around the circle. So how many radians can we get out of one circle if I've just sectioned them off here for you? 
We can get six whole radians out of a circle, but what do you notice about this? Yeah, we still have some left, so it's not exactly six radians. So six was the closest guess so far. Now you're going to guess again. What do you think the uh, closest decimal approximation to the nearest tenth is of how many radians you can get around one circle? He says 6.3, 6.4, 6 6.2. All right, we're going to find out which one of these, if any, is right. The circumference of a circle can be calculated with 2 pi, and most commonly it is 2 pi r, but in a unit circle the radius is what? 1, so it doesn't change anything. That's why it's been left out on this slide. But if you multiply 2 times pi, you're going to come out with approximately 6.3. So that means 6.3 was the right guess. 6.3 radians approximately in one circle. We are going to convert degrees into a radian measurement. There are a couple of ways you can do it. I'll show you both ways. You determine which one will be the easiest for you to figure out. Here is 45 degrees and it's floating over to the middle and shortening up so I have room to deal with this. Split screen. We're going to try the first way on the left hand side. Uh, here is a circle and I'm going to approximate 45 degrees to be about there. How many, uh, what fraction of a circle is 45 degrees? I hear one-sixth, it's one-eighth, he's right. 45 degrees represents one-eighth of a circle, and if you split up each quadrant into pieces of 45, you can see you have eight pieces of the circle. So 45 is one-eighth of a circle. If you go 45 degrees, you've made one-eighth of a turn. So let's take note of that. And... What did we just finish with? We said that the circumference of a circle, the distance around it, was how much? A in terms of pi. 2 pi. So how about we do 1 8 of 2 pi, multiply those together to get 2 pi over 8, and 2 pi over 8 reduces down to what? So we just have pi over 4. Okay, any questions about this left-hand side way? Okay, now the other way you can do it, which we will do on the right-hand side in white, we start with 45 degrees. To convert any degree measurement into radians, you can simply multiply those degrees by pi over 180. So if I do that, I get 45 pi over 180. Can I reduce 45 over 180? What does it reduce down to? Yeah, it reduces down to pi over 4. So we get the same answer regardless of what we do. Convert 33 degrees to radians. And we'll do another split screen here. Let's do 33 over, uh, gosh, what can we, 33 is how many, what fraction of a circle? How can I find that? Yeah, 33 over 360 is a good place to start. That's the, fra that's the fraction of the circle. Can I reduce 33 over 360? Will 3 go into both of those? Yeah, 11 over 120. I think I, that's as far as you can reduce it. 
So what would I do with that 11 over 120 if I used the first way? Times it by 2 pi, yeah. So that would give me 22 pi over 120. Can I reduce that? What does it reduce down to? 11 pi over 60. Okay. Well, let's try it the other way and see if we get the same thing. 33 degrees times pi over 180. That would be 33 pi over 180. And if I divide each of those by 3, I would get 11 over 60. And that's 11 pi over 60. So whichever way you want to use, it's up to you. Convert radians to degrees. Okay, start with 4 thirds pi, which could also be written as 4 pi over 3. Remember the second way that we used where we multiplied by pi over 180 to get the radians? Well, now we are going to degrees from radians. So if I multiplied by pi over 180 to go to radians, what would I have to do to get out of radians? Not divide by 2 pi. Not add. You could multiply by something. Before we multiplied by pi over 180. But now we're going in reverse. So instead of multiplying by pi over 180 we are dividing by pi over 180 and whenever you divide by a fraction you flip and multiply so what is the flip of it's 180 over pi yeah so you would multiply 4 pi over 3 times the inverse of pi over 180 which is 180 over pi. What happens to pi? Cancels out. Can I reduce anything in here? 3 into itself once and into 180 60 times. I still have a 4 over here times 60 240 degrees to go from radians back to degrees I would have to multiply by 180 over pi so let's put this in a form that's easier to to look at negative 2 over 3 and put that pi on the top and then multiply by 180 over pi and pi cancels out 3 into itself once into 180 60 times and I'm left with a negative 2 times 60, so a negative 120 degrees. On your homework tonight, you have to complete this table. It has degrees, and then you convert to radians. And then the next table has radians. You convert to degrees. Now you have theta in radians, and you have to find out what cosine of that is. Now, if you keep good notes, you should have a unit circle 
uh, from before that has radian measures all the way around it. Remember we started at zero and then we went up to what pi over 12, pi over 6, uh, 90 was pi over 2, 180 was pi, 270 was 3 pi over 2, and then back around again was 2 pi or 0. If you have that, then you can easily figure out what the uh, degrees are for those and then figure out uh, your angle measurements, or not angle measurements, but your side lengths for the triangle that you would have to draw in there. And then find cosine, sine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant of each of those. So convert pi over 3 in the first one to degrees and draw your triangle. Figure out what the degrees would be in each of those angles. Find the side lengths and then find each of these. Over here this is kind of like a Sudoku puzzle. You know in uh, Sudoku you, have, you can't have the same number in the same column or in the same row. Uh, it's similar to that, not exactly the same, but you use the same process to make it easier on yourself. Here's what you can do. Notice that theta is not given to you at all. You have to figure out what it is in each case. Here's a zero. I think it would be easy to figure out where tangent was zero on your unit circle. And then once you do that, see if it also matches up as cosine being negative 1 in that same spot. And if it does, then you've just found the degrees. And with that, you can figure out sine of theta once you do that. And then another one like, um, like this one, negative 1. Find where sine would be negative 1 on your unit circle and also be cosine of theta being zero. Once you figure that out you have your degrees and then use those degrees to find tangent theta. And then you have some questions to answer after that.